Welcome to the business of race. I'm Margaret Greenberg. I'm Gina Greenlee. So how did two women, one black and one white, come to write the business of race? Well, actually it began on May 26th, 2020. You might recall that that was the day after the murder of George Floyd. And I called my dear friend, Gina. Uh, we live about 1600 miles apart. And I called her just to check in on her. And all I said was, Gina, how are you doing today? And what's going on in this world? And I appreciated that, Margaret. You simply held the space for me to share what I was feeling. And in so doing, I also shared some of my experiences of being a Black woman in the United States and racial profiling. And Margaret and I have been friends for more than two decades. And before the murder of George Floyd, I can count on one hand the number of times we spoke about our um, different uh, racial identities and lived experiences. So when I shared some of these stories with Margaret, it was the first time in our 20 plus year friendship that she was hearing them. And I said um, to Gina, I said, Gina, you ought to write about this. And I said, <laughs> I said, nope. I said, you know, Margaret, I, um, I used to write an opinion column for a, a major Metro daily newspaper and on occasion before the ubiquity of cell phone cameras when a situate when an incident such as uh, what occurred with George Floyd happened and it, and it and it happens all the time and it still happens. Um, I would write about it and I was summarily dismissed as the angry black woman. So no, I'm not going to write about it. And then Gina said to me, and if you write about it, Margaret, you will be dismissed as the privileged white woman. So what if we wrote something together? Now, of course, we didn't start by writing a book. We wrote just one article. And because we're business professionals, we posted it on LinkedIn. And that one article was called, The Workplace is the Perfect Place to Discuss the Undiscussables. We had so much um, commentary, interest. People said, finally, we're able to talk about this taboo subject that we haven't really addressed in the workplace. Thank you. And so we wrote another and another and another and became a series, which then ultimately we decided to write The Business of Race. So here's what we're gonna do in the next few minutes. We're gonna share a little bit about, well, what is this book? What is it all about? And then we're gonna share with you, what is the business case, not for diversity in general, but specifically for racial diversity? Gina? So with that, before we share what the business of race is, we just like to take a moment and share what the business of race is not. Margaret and I are not DEI experts. We are organizational development professionals, learning and development professionals, coaches, and um, workplace strategists. We did, of course, research the history of DEI. We interviewed more than two dozen professionals for this book. Among them were longstanding DEI experts. So we did educate ourselves, but that is not the lens of the book. That's the content, but the lens is, a, is an organizational development business lens. And we'll talk more about that. The business of race also is not specifically for any one group. As we were writing the book, friends, colleagues, perfect strangers, upon learning the title, asked us, is this a book for white people? Is this a book for black people, biracial people, Asian people? No, it's a book for all people who work in organizations for profit, not for profit. The business of race is not prescriptive. There is no formula no just add water, no easy solutions. Best practices, 
of course, that came out of our own research from the more than two dozen interviews that we conducted. At the end of the day, however, each organizational journey is individual. So let's look specifically at the book itself, 14 chapters, about 355 pages. And the first half of the book, the first seven chapters focuses on the inner work. What do we mean by the inner work? Before we can collaborate with one another in the workplace to advance racial equity, we must first do undertake our own personal journey, examine our own racial identities, the lived experiences that flow from those racial identities, developing the skills to the interpersonal skills to share our experiences with others who have done their own work, to educate ourselves so that we have uh, a sufficient um, common context and lexicon. It's very hard to have these conversations and to do this work without having a shared context like we would with any other strategic business imperative. And then that inner work is the foundation that allows us to come together and use the ready-made coalition that we have in the workplace because we work together to advance common goals, mark, uh, products and services that we develop. And this allows us, this inner work allows us to come together to reimagine our business policies and practices to advance racial equity, to create and sustain an anti-racial workplace. So there are five key themes in the business of race. And the first is a new lens that we bring to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. It is not a social justice lens. We take a business lens. We believe racial equity is a moral imperative, but that is not the focus of the business of race. We look at racial diversity like you would any other strategic priority. The second lens that we use is what we call an asset lens. We apply the science of positive psychology to race work. For example, we look at what businesses and people in them gain by creating a more racially diverse workplace. We call people in to conversations rather than call people out. And we focus on turning microaggressions into micro opportunities. The second lens is self-discovery, that inner work that Gina just talked about that buttresses the outer work. The third lens is it's not a program, it's a journey, which means your journey will be different from others because you are you. No two journeys will look alike. We've been on our own journey and the business of race is the product of that journey that continues to this day. For example, the first time I heard the term anti-racist, I struggled with that. As an applied positive psychology a practitioner, it just seemed so anti to me. Can't we find something else? And it seemed counter to the lens, that positive lens we were taking. But then I got curious and I did a bit more digging. And some of you may already know the difference between a non-racist and an anti-racist workplace. But for those of you that don't, a non-racist workplace is one in which a company doesn't consciously discriminate against people of color, but neither does it recognize or acknowledge the role race and racism has played in the workplace in society at large. So no actions are taken to address racial inequities in how the company operates. On the other hand, an anti-racist workplace first acknowledges that racism exists and then connects the dots between that history and the toll that it exacts on individuals, on organizations and society. So leaders in an anti-racist uh, organization, they actively engage everyone in their organization in naming and claiming a strategic imperative. 
to cultivate a racially diverse and inclusive and equitable workplace without shaming and without blaming. The fourth theme in the business of race is about the power of stories. We need new narratives. We need new stories from diverse perspectives. And as science fiction author Ursula Le Guin wrote, there have been great societies that did not use the wheel, but there have never been societies that did not tell stories. Stories are humanity's tools for instruction, for adhering to our societal norms. We need to begin telling more inclusive stories. Have you ever wondered why Black History Month or Black History is relegated to just one month out of the entire year? And lastly, courage is the last theme. Courage to name what you see, to look at yourself, to change the status quo. Know that you are going to make mistakes on this journey. You'll need to be comfortable with the uncomfortable and be resilient. Our hope in writing The Business of Race was that it would give you, the readers, the courage to talk about race and racism, and more importantly, to do something constructive about it, no matter your level in the organization, no matter your racial identity. So now the business case. So why do Margaret and I believe that the workplace is the perfect place <clears throat> to advance racial equity? First, for many people, and we'll speak to the United States since that's what we know, the workplace is for many the first time and perhaps the only time where we interact with others who are from, who have different life experiences because of their racial or ethnic identities, because of their religion. The United States remains a highly segregated um, country. And we write about that. We write about racial restrictive covenants, something Margaret and I did not know until we embarked on this journey. And we learned that racial restrictive covenants keeps the United States um, very segregated in terms of its neighborhood. So that might be the first time you meet someone who looks different from you. In fact, that is exactly where Margaret and I met more than two decades ago. I hired Margaret to do some strategic work for an organization that I was working in, and she lived 25 miles east of the multicultural capital city in a predominantly white neighborhood where she was raising her family. And were it not for the workplace, Margaret and I likely would not have met. The second reason why we believe the workplace is the perfect place to do this work is because of that ready-made coalition that I spoke about earlier. Every day, scores, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people come together in the workplace to advance a shared purpose. That shared purpose is in developing and marketing products and services to the wider world. So we're already working together. We already have these relationships. We already have been celebrating wins um, together. Why not use those existing relationships and dynamics and what we call a ready-made coalition to advance an anti-racist uh, workplace? The third reason we believe why the workplace is the perfect place to do this work is because it is where acquiring new skills is the norm. In order to remain employable, if you are an employee, in order to remain relevant, if you are an employer, a consultant, a small business owner, it requires that all of us are, con are continuous learners. We're learning something new. It's expected in the workplace as new technologies become available, as new modes of thinking, learning, uh, processes for uh, making products, inventorying products. Uh, all of these uh, new skills 
we need to acquire all the time. And so being able to navigate successfully a multicultural workplace, we believe is a 21st century competency. It's a skill we all must have. And the expectation going forward is that we all acquire it. Regrettably, it's one of the few places, the workplaces where Margaret and I believe in society that civility still exists. Try to talk about race and racism while standing online at the coffee shop and it will likely deteriorate or, or escalate. However, talk about race and racism in the workplace. Well, we have norms that guide our behavior in the workplace and ones where we need to address each other with humanity and civility, because if we don't, then we might not continue to work in those places. So it's we have boundaries and norms that guide our behavior and it makes doing this work much more productive in that work, in that setting. The fifth reason why we believe the workplace is the perfect place to do this work is that the workplace historically has been a, a catalyst for societal change, transformational change from the industrial revolution through to the digital, digital age and beyond what we can imagine beyond our lifetime. The workplace has been the place where that has led societal change. For example, most recently in the pandemic, we have all experienced how workplaces in many instances were ahead of government in protecting their employees by having employees work from home. And the sixth reason we believe why the workplace is the perfect place to do this work is because businesses don't operate in a vacuum. I, you know, I just talked about the pandemic uh, when employees go to work, whether they do it virtually, whether they go to a, a brick and mortar location, they bring their whole self to work. They don't leave their identities at home. They may mask some of those identities, but they don't leave them at home. And so if we're having uh, racial inequities in society, if we're experiencing some of the horrors that we've seen that, that launched the conversation for this book, Employees bring that to work and they may not be talking to you about it, <laughs> but they're talking to each other. They're on social media. Businesses don't operate in a vacuum. Businesses are a part of society and society also impacts business. So continue with the business case um, for a few more minutes. Um, there's a quote here from Vijay Eswan that says the case for establishing a truly diverse workforce grows more compelling each year. The moral argument is weight enough, but the financial impact as proven by multiple studies makes this a no brainer. Now you'll notice uh, Vijay S. Warren that we actually identify um, his um, ethnicity. Uh, he self identifies as Malaysian uh, Indian and we do that throughout the business of race. Whenever we are quoting someone uh, in the public uh, eye or someone that we've interviewed. Um, and the reason why we do that is so you can get a feel for how their lived experiences shape their perspective. So what is the business impact? Why is racial diversity actually good for business as our subtitle claims? Well, decades of research on diversity in, gen in general, meaning gender, sexual orientation, et cetera, um, has found that organizations with more diversity outperform less diverse organizations on the basis of profit, innovation, productivity, and attracting and retaining talent. However, while researching the business of race, it was difficult at first to find data specific to racial diversity. So we kept digging. And we did find data from consulting giants um, such as McKinsey, uh, Boston Consulting Group, uh, Deloitte and others that showed that racial diversity does indeed positively impact those four measures, profitability, innovation, productivity and talent. Now we're not going to cite all those statistics here uh, but they are all cited in the reference section of the business of race. 
so that you can create your own business case that you need um, for your organization. Oops, oops. So while we're still on measures um, for a moment, um, we've been talking about um, measures and it, it begs the question, what does equity mean? What does the E mean? Uh, equity is actually a relative newcomer in the DEI um, professional practice. Uh, we, in the chapter three, we call it, who snuck the E between the D and the I? So there's not a lot of agreement on what E means today. It's still evolving. But the way Gina and I uh, define it is E measures how and to what extent D and I are embedded into an organization's business strategy in every business policy and practice, not just hiring, but promotion, procurement, marketing, advertising, philanthropy, all business policies and practices. And second, the E perpetually monitors and as necessary recalibrates the diversity and the inclusion to stay ahead of potential relapse and continually advance toward an anti-racist workplace. So to conclude our metrics section of the business case, math has no opinion. In, but in this area of diversity, says Melody Hobson, we want credit for trying. You don't get credit for trying to meet earning expectations. You don't get credit for trying to deliver the product on time to your client. You either do or do not. That's another reason why Margaret and I have placed our activist work within the context of organizations because baked into it is accountability, measures. If you do not have measures for your um, success, for your goals, you will not be viable over the long term. That's, that's a given in any organization. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, you can continue to engage with us. Here's some different ways. Um, be sure to visit our website, businessofrace.com, uh, where you can download a complimentary chapter of the book. And keep in mind, um, there are over 40 additional resources in the business of race, from assessment tools to other um, resources, and most of them are free. So thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.